Hi, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Novogratz, and um, I'm here with the third principal um, to do uh, an excerpt from uh, my new book, uh, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, and I'm really happy to be here with everyone. Um, I wrote this book because after 35 years of trying to create change, um, both in helping to pioneer a new sector, impact investing, and also through my work investing in and supporting literally about a thousand change agents all around the world. Um, it struck me that those who build not just organizations or companies, but actually change systems have character and that the kind of character that the world needs right now is a character that is deeply based in, in values and in, in a moral framework. By moral, I don't mean a set of rules prescribed from some higher authority, but a frame that insists on putting our shared humanity and the sustainability of the earth at the center of our systems rather than profit. Um, Yesterday, I spoke about the first real practice of the 12 that I will be discussing and reading excerpts from until May 26, which was Redefine Success. And today, um, I'm going to focus on the moral imagination. Because once we move from a definition of success based on money, power, and fame to one that looks at the amount of good that we create in the world, the amount of beauty we, we release, of human energy we set forth. Um, well, then we need to start with a very specific skill, which I would say is a hard skill, not a soft skill, moral imagination. We have to cultivate a muscular sense of empathy, but we can't stop with empathy because empathy by itself simply reinforces the status quo. The moral imagination takes empathy or the ability to put yourself in another person's shoes and moves to what we call it acumen immersion. Brian Stevenson, the civil rights advocate, would call it proximity. Get close to the problem. Understand not only another's perspective, but think about how to build a solution from that perspective. And that means the third step which is understanding the systems that keep a situation in its place. Because let's face it, the status quo exists for a reason. It works for most of the players, even if it doesn't make sense to all of us that that working for um, should be very positive because sometimes it's negative and yet it's more comfortable to stay with the negative than to actually change. And then the fourth step is to act. And while moral ima imagination may not sound like a verb, within it is that muscular proclivity toward action. So I'm going to read an excerpt, a shorter one today, um, from my book, um, from chapter three, which is called Cultivate the Moral Imagination. Cultivate Moral Imagination. Here it goes. In 2009, Carlos Ignacio Velasco, a soft-spoken, whip-smart young Colombian working as a representative of his country's coffee industry in Tokyo, met Mayumi Ogata, a passionate chocolate connoisseur who had just completed a four-year pursuit to identify the world's finest varieties of cacao. After working for years in a premium chocolate company, Mayumi had wearied of the toll the industry took on farmers and the earth. More than 90% of the world's chocolate is produced by about 5 million smallholder families, 90% of whom earn less than $2 per day. And 70% of cacao is cultivated in West Africa, often through unsustainable farming methods that have worn down the soil. Faced with these alarming statistics, Mayumi sought new areas where high quality varieties of the cacao fruit could be cultivated more profitably for the farmers and without harming the planet. 
Of the many places she'd visited, from Indonesia to Bolivia, Colombia ultimately captured Mayumi's heart. There she found diverse, delicate varieties of cacao in a number of regions. But these same regions had also suffered a half century of civil war and still bore wounds from the violence of drug lords, the FARC, or the revolutionary armed forces of Colombia, guerrillas, and paramilitaries. The lands rich in cacao are also geographically isolated from Colombia's main cities, and education and skills levels are quite low. Despite the risks, Mayumi assessed that prospects for cacao production were phenomenal there. Besides, she loved a challenge. Carlos had already been thinking about what more he could do to contribute to his country. Those early meetings with Mayumi in Tokyo had set his imagination alight. If Colombia could be known for some of the best coffee beans on earth, he wondered, why couldn't it also build a world-class chocolate industry? After all, coffee was introduced to Colombia from Ethiopia in the 19th century. Cacao, on the other hand, was part of the region's natural inheritance. Moreover, the post-conflict areas of the country needed deliberate investment in the land and its people if peace were to flourish. What better way to contribute than to build a company that would produce some of the world's finest cacao in partnership with local communities? Here, Carlos believed, was a chance to demonstrate the power of business if infused with moral imagination, to produce not just profits for the few, but prosperity and peace where communities had for too long felt abandoned. Carlos and Mayumi founded Cacao de Colombia that same year, 2009, and began work on building trusted relationships with farmers groups in four different post-conflict regions. This process would take years, but time plus conscious effort infused with moral imagination enables possibility. In 2017, two years after, two years into Acumen's investment in Cacao de Colombia, I had the privilege of visiting a farming community in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, one of the highest coastal mountain ranges on earth. Located in Colombia's far north, there lies the ancestral lands of the Arhuacos, an indigenous people known for their commitment to living in harmony with the universe. In those mountains, Mayumi had come upon an exquisite rare white cacao guaranteed to produce some of the world's finest chocolate. She and Carlos dreamed of forming a partnership with the Arhuacos to produce a world-class chocolate and export a philosophy, not just a product to the rest of the world. It was certainly not a given that the Arhuacos would be interested. They had kept their traditions intact despite ter terrors imposed by colonizers, drug dealers, and soldiers. And they considered the white cacao a sacred fruit, no longer cultivated or commercialized. Greed-oriented capitalism posed a new threat. Carlos and Mayumi would therefore have to earn the Arhuacos trust designing a transformative partnership, and that took time. The work required starting with an understanding of local history, customs, and values before proceeding with mutual respect. As Acumen's Latin American director, Virgilio Barco and I drove with Mayumi along Colombia's coast to our meeting point with, with the Arhuacos, I asked Mayumi how the partnership had been built. How had she and Carlos and the Arhuacos weighed what would be gained and what would be lost by partnering to grow and commercialize the rare cacao? Mayumi spoke about the spirituality of the Arhuacos, who believe in the interconnection of all living things. I feel a resonance with this idea, she said. I was raised with Shintoism in Japan. We also see the connection between ourselves and the natural world. Between my own belief system and the Arhuacos, I can count more than 800 divinities inspired by water, wind, and the earth. I respond to their spiritualism. I respond to their worldview. 
our mutual understanding helped build trust. They could feel both my respect and my connection to them. A spiritual connection is one way to transcend lines of difference and locate commonality. Mayumi and Carlos could also have connected based on other strands of their identities, their love of nature, their commitment to learning. But for Mayumi especially, spiritual bonds created the basis for her deep curiosity and respect. We arrived at a modest village nestled by the pale blue sea where it greets a sudden rise of green towering mountains. I thought to myself, no wonder the Atahualcos believe this place to be the center of the universe. Mamo Camilo, a spiritual leader and several of his associates welcomed us warmly and guided us to sit with them beneath the tree. The Arruacos wear simple homespun white tunics and loosely fitted trousers. The men's long black hair cascades out of their white woven caps, which symbolize the snow-capped peaks of the sacred mountains. Mamo Camilo, distinguished and serene, though undifferentiated in dress, clearly garnered the respect of the other Arruacos who made way for him when he walked by and hung on his words when he spoke. The mamos, or wise guides, exert powerful influence with, on, within Arruaco communities. Selected as boys, they train for a decade learning the philosophy of the Arruacos, along with traditional medicinal practices and the arts of listening and arbitrary, arbitrating differences among peoples. The day I first visited the Arruacos with Carlos and Mayumi, the Mamo spent three hours with us, providing a master class in the Arruaco cosmology. The Arruacos believe that nature and society are united by a single immutable law of the universe that has always existed and always will, even after human beings have left the planet. We see your culture as the world's little brother. Mamo Camilo said, with no trace of scolding. Your people think the land is for their pleasure alone. Ours is a philosophy that must grow with maturity. We, the Arruacos, are the elder brothers. We come with understanding that we must respect all living creatures on earth. We seek harmony. Now the land has given us the rarest cacao, and it is to all of us to nurture and to ensure its preservation. As Mamo Camilo expounded on the cosmology of the Arruacos, he modeled something else, how to own your power. His confidence and worldview were essential components of his negotiations. Though economically poorer, his community was argu arguably richer in spirit and happiness. And he understood that the Arruacos had something to give, not just materially, but in terms of their philosophy. After acknowledging and affirming the respectful way in which Carlos and Mayumi had entered negotiations, Mamo Camilo shared some of his worries about partnering with those who operate in a modern capitalist system. What happens to the earth if we see it as a resource, but not a responsibility? As we walked back toward the village center, I noticed some of the young men holding cell phones. I wondered aloud how the tribe ultimately would draw the line between needs and wants, and whether entering a contract with the company might open a Pandora's box of temptations. We understand that we cannot live in the past, Mamo Camilo said. To survive, we must engage with the larger world. Today, our people need phones if they are going to interact with those beyond the Arruacos. We need a few other essential things like batteries and solar lights. And we need to continually remind ourselves of our responsibility to the earth. Then he added that they would not have made a deal with anyone but Cacao de Colombia because of an earned mutual respect. But he added a caveat. We will partner only so long as our project does not disturb our balance with nature. If we lose the balance, we will end the partnership. Do you understand? Yes, I said, I believed I did. 
This was a negotiation based not on extraction or profit alone. The agreement with the, between the Arulacos and the company was more covenant than contract, a moral commitment to remaining accountable to each other, to showing up, to listening. Spending immersive time together had enabled each side to understand what the other needed in order for the relationship to work. For the Arruacos, participation with the company was a means to sustaining their community, enabling it to continue transmitting its ancestral wisdom to, ven to benefit humanity. For Cacao de Colombia, it was the opportunity to build a successful business that valued human and natural resources, not only financial rewards. Both community and company will be changed by the partnership just as any relationship of equals changes both partners over time. As the company grows and the Arruacos become wealthier as a tribe, pressures to conform to business as usual and cut corners or demand faster growth will inevitably increase. Finding values aligned investors steeped in their own moral imagination will be key. But had the company's founder, founders not dared first to imagine what could be, Cacao de Colombia would never have gotten started. In 2018, the International Chocolate Awards, honoring the best chocolates in the world, gave Arruaco Chocolates gold and silver medals in the single bean and micro batch categories. This achievement was possible because of a Shinto observing Japanese cacao whisperer, a Catholic raised Shinto aspiring Colombian entrepreneur, and an indigenous community adhering to a philosophy based on one, oneness with the cosmos. Each had the moral imagination to extend a hand to those who were different, seeking what united them and bonding in purpose. Moral imagination offers a powerful lens through which to see the world's potential, recognize its disparities and work to address them. Use it widely and practice it wisely. So if you have questions, please um, put it in the chat and I will um, answer it. And it's nice to see um, some friends uh, already showing up from Kenya and Chicago and Peru um, and Ethiopia. Um, and I'm going to answer the questions as I see them in, in order. The first is, have you seen any examples of moral imagination responding to the COVID crisis? I really appreciate that question um, because while this is a time of so much despair, loss, and for any of you who are undergoing either, and probably all of us are having some of that, um, my condolences. Um, and yet within it, Going back to this idea of moral imagination, the humility to see the world as it is, and the audacity to imagine what it could be, I am seeing some of the most extraordinary um, action enlivened souls. Um, I think of Sam Polk, who runs a company called Every Table in Compton, um, Southern Los Angeles. And this is a company, Sam was actually a Wall Streeter who wanted to do something about food deserts or those places in the United States that um, really had no access to affordable fresh foods. And so we started a company called um, Every Table that would provide affordable, nutritious, fast meals um, in a restaurant setting and had built it to the, to the point where he had eight. And when the shutdown order happened, um, he didn't want to be like other restaurants and just close and furlough his employees. And, and he realized that his North Star, his mission was to deliver affordable, healthy food. So he sent out a message on social media saying, if you need a meal, let us know. If you can pay for it, great, we'll deliver it. If you can't, let us know that too. And if you're willing to pay it forward, please donate here. And within a couple of weeks, every table had delivered 160,000 
meals to people who needed meals, not just low-income residents and college students, but elderly homes and homeless. And then the governor, Gavin Newsom, displayed his own sense of moral imagination when he partnered with the private sector hotels so that the homeless could have safe places to stay and not and be able to socially distance. And so every table then partnered with the California government to bring meals to uh, the homeless in the hotels. And so I'm watching a release of human energy and ingenuity, innovation, come together from the private sector, civil society, from individual philanthropists, um, from this company. That's the power of moral imagination in crisis, in action. And this crisis asks all of us to dig deeper into that moral imagination. Again, not in a soft way, but in a muscular, determined way. Um, thanks for that question. And how do we cultivate moral imagination among our young people in our school systems? It's another really great question. Um, I think we cultivate the moral imagination, again, starting with this idea of empathy, this idea that we need to learn how to put ourselves in another person's shoes. It's funny. It's in some ways, it's not a very sophisticated idea. It was very humbling for me. I, um, um, my mother gave me this little book that I had written in fifth grade because my teacher apparently had given us a little exercise where every day we were given a, a sentence that we had to complete. And one sentence was, it really bugs me when, and as a 10 year old, I wrote, it really bugs me when people make fun of other people especially, and I use the language of the 1970s, so forgive me. I said, especially when they make fun of handicapped people or disabled people, um, and um, or specially abled people. And um, I said, you know, if every one of us one day a year could have to use a wheelchair or wear blindfolds, maybe we would understand how people who saw the world and experienced the world differently um, might have to navigate it. And, and I'm not the only 10 year old. I wasn't the only 10 year old um, who thought things like that. And I think when we're little, we sometimes have a natural empathy that our parents tell us um, to distance ourselves from. Look away, don't talk to the homeless person. When our, our childlike inclination wants to understand. And so, Maybe we can do a better job in our schools, in our families, by asking our children to take risks like that. At Acumen, we used to do a, um, an exercise with every fellow and sometimes with our team. When the, te when the team would come in for the day, or the fellows, we would take away everything from them, including their wallets, and just give them $5 and a Metro card to use the underground. We would tell them, to go into low-income communities and not pretend they were poor, just go and be among um, people in those communities. Sit at the at the public clinics and the hospitals. Go into the homeless shelters and the and the food banks, and ask people about their lives. Learn something. Come back. See what it feels like to have five dollars a metro card and no cell phone. And um, the stories people would come back with were incredible and not just the new yorkers or the americans some of the most powerful stories came from people from nigeria kenya colombia and panama who would come back and say i felt so sad because people talked about their loneliness and the fact that they couldn't rely on family and it was something we just didn't understand and so we started to learn more about our own communities and ask those questions too and saw again how much we have to learn from each other. So thanks for that question because we need to teach this as a hard skill. Um, another question that say, um, on the book's intro, you mentioned how technology has a great potential to do harm and at the same time does a lot of good. I'd love your ideas on how to cultivate moral imagination in regards to technology's effect on society. I think that's another great question, Mar Cabra um, from Spain. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I think that we underestimate that on the one hand, certainly in my generation over the last 30 years, the revolutions of, of technology and capitalism really did create incredible levels of freedom, innovation, lifted hundreds of millions, if not a billion people out of poverty, but it, those same forces have within them the potential to destroy us. And so we must have moral imagination to think about how we um, use technology as a means and not as an end. One of the best examples that I could think of um, is how we, we, we see ourselves as a bridge essentially to use technology to connect those individuals who may not have access to those who do. Um, a woman who actually I write about in the book in a later chapter called the Conform Avoid the Conformity Trap, Gayatri Jolie, um, works with low-income women from a, a, a community outside of Delhi where um, women are often not given education and are married very, very young. And, um, and she works with them as tailors and, and, and builds them as what are called master G's. And one of her master G's, which are the highest level of talent in terms of the tailoring industry is a woman named Rajni. And when I first met Rajni, she couldn't um, speak very much English, but, um, man could she see and Gayatri had Rajni make a pattern because they wanted to gift me a jacket that they that they created for me and Rajni was doing my measurements and through a translator she said madam you know I got your measurement me measurements perfectly and I said how and she said why well, watching you on YouTube and and that for me lit a switch that we now had a mechanism because then I said, you know, I'd love for you to make a jacket that I paid for. Um, and Gayatri could intermediate. And she said, oh, that would be a great idea, but um, maybe you should go on Pinterest, she said. Tell me designs of jackets that you like. And, um, and then what's up them to me and Gayatri and we can make a jacket for you. And I thought this is about bridging and using technology as a means and not as an end. We're also seeing technology being used for people to have conversations across lines of difference and Acumen Academy, which is Acumen School for Social Change, um, which anyone can access, has courses in how to do that, where you bring diverse groups together and really practice having these difficult conversations. So check it out. If you buy Manifesto for, um, a moral revolution until May 26th. Uh, the course, the master course to for the book is um, and free and it has a lot of courses like this. Danyan Lorani from Pakistan. Do you think people will look, take forward any of the positive realizations that have come about due to the pandemic or will we return to business as usual? You know, crises, exacerbate who we are as human beings. We've already seen it, some of the worst behavior and some of the best. And we have to focus on and the best. I'm seeing so many people saying how much they're learning, not only in terms of what it means to connect using technology to not just their loved ones, but meeting people they might never meet across the world. I'm seeing businesses recognize that they don't have to do the same kind of travel that they were doing. We're all seeing how much cleaner the air is. I'm watching a flourishing of human kindness as we cheer for health workers and essential workers. We're having conversations about what does it mean to be essential. And ironically, we're not talking about those who have earned um, celebrity fame because they're powerful or because they're rich or because we've just decided that they are famous. Um, but our heroes are becoming our health workers. Our heroes are becoming those who make our lives possible on an everyday purpose. We have to tell those stories. And we have to tell those stories in ways that all of us can see ourselves. Because right now, this coronavirus is reminding us that our systems are broken and it is us to remember that we are the system, we get to decide. And the moral imagination 
will allow us to do this if we have the courage to imagine new role models and then to build new business models like a Gaudi Colombia and other companies that put our humanity and the sustainability of the earth, the community that we can build at the center of everything we do and not just profit. So thank you for listening. Thank you for your brilliant questions. Um, I know so many of you are doing the hard work of this, of the moral revolution every single day. And I wish you all the luck in the world. Have a great day. See you tomorrow.